Our next speaker is certainly no stranger to us. Brother Danny Douglas is a native of Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. And he's been preaching the gospel on a regular basis since 1977. He's served churches in Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, Virginia. He's also done full-time work in the Ukraine and the United Kingdom. It was in, it was in England where we met. That's getting to be a long time ago. Dub was even old then. He was there at that time. But we have grown to love Danny and appreciate his dedication to the truth. And he is working presently. Let's see, what is it called? Mount Pleasant Central Church? Is that what it's called? Central Church of Mount Pleasant? And he also works for the Trans-American Insurance Company. He does some work where his wife is from the Philippines, in the Philippines. And he certainly has the faithful support of his wife, Larnie Tabalon Douglas. And they're blessed with two precious children, Lydia and Daniel Moses. And Daniel Moses is with us today. He's helping his daddy do his outlines and telling him what to preach, and guiding him along. We do uh, rejoice in Daniel Moses. Where is he? Is he around here somewhere? In his growth and development. I think he must have decided he'd done enough to help you. <laughs> but we are thankful for Danny. He stands for the truth. He loves the truth. And I think those of us who know him, I don't think we've ever seen anybody more conscientious in trying to do what's right and be consistent at it and steadfast. Danny come preach to us on the fatal error on John chapter 7, 37 through 39. Thank you, Brother Brown, for the kind words. Appreciate the good prayer led by Brother Dub and the good singing by Brother Blake. I'm thankful for the Lord's Church here at Spring, for her faithful elders and preacher and Brother Brown, and for the gracious hospitality they extended to Daniel and me this week. And the last time he came with me, I don't know where he is right now. I guess he'll be back in here in a minute. It was certainly a blessing to have him with me and thank the Lord and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. You know, uh, all the lectures I've heard since I've been here have been very outstanding and good, including the two this morning. I appreciate those very much. I want to thank the brethren for that. One well, of the brethren yesterday pointed out that one of these emerging church fellows said that he was more interested in saving the whales than saving souls. But from my Bible, I understand, from the King James Version, it said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, not go ye into all the world and save the whales. Moreover, it does not say, go ye into all the world and do miracles today. The command to go and preach the gospel is a permanent thing, but not the miracles. Moreover, it does not say go and convince everyone as you go and preach that you don't just need the gospel, that you need something extra in addition to the gospel. But Paul said, as our young brother pointed out a while ago, from Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Today we are dealing with the topic, Fatal Error, on John 7, verses 37 to 39. Here Jesus said, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst... Let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake ye of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. 
We know that the setting here is the Feast of the Tabernacles. It is referred to in Exodus 23, 16, and the Feast of Harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the Feast of Ingathering, which is the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. The Feast of the Ingathering. Brother J.W. McGarvey states, If we may trust the later Jewish accounts, it was the custom during the feast seven days for the priests and people in joyful procession to go to the pool of Siloam with a golden pitcher and bring water thence to pour out before the altar in commemoration of the water which Moses brought from the rock in which typified the Christ 1 Corinthians 10 and verse number 4. Brother Guy in Wood says that according to Jewish history, when the water was poured on the altar, quote, the Hallel, consisting of Psalms 113 to 118, was chanted by the Levites, and the people repeated each line after the priests. This was a remembrance of the time when the Israelites suffered lack of water in the wilderness. But of course here Jesus is promising a greater water as he did to the woman at the well in John 4 verses 13 and 14 when he said to her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. In the book of John and this is significant that we understand this, and I'm afraid that a lot of members of the church don't. But believing in the New Testament sense and in the book of John surely is connected to obedience. When Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, Mark 16, 16. The denomination sometimes jump in that. They say, well, you see the last part there, he that believeth not. But actually there, the believing implies obedience. The one who does not believe and obey the gospel will be damned. And in John 3, 36, in the American Standard Version, we see here that belief and obedience is parallel by contrast. He that believeth on the Son hath eternal life. But he that obeyeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Another example is John 3.16, which is one of the most abused scriptures in the Bible. The believing here certainly pertains to obedience. When Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9, we read, Though he were a son, that is Christ, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. But now let's look more closely here at the invitation of Jesus Christ in John 7, verse 37. The Lord said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. We know that this scripture declares to us that God is no respecter of persons, as many other scriptures do. That whosoever will may come, Revelation 22, verse 17. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. That is, partake of the many spiritual blessings that are in Jesus Christ that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus, according to Ephesians 1, 3. And in verse 7, in whom, that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. In a similar invitation, in Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The heavy ladenness here referred to as the burden of the soul imposed by sin, and the rest is the lifting up of sin off of man by Jesus Christ, 
the Lord and Savior, who certainly loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Revelation 1 and verse number 5. But we know that regarding the promise in verses 38 and 39, where Jesus said, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And we understand this, that it pertains to the giving of the Holy Ghost that would happen in Acts chapter 2. Now it may be argued that from the Christian there flows many blessings because indeed we are the light of the world, the salt of the earth, and we are to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. Someone might say that this is the living water that flows out. Well, the Bible does teach that the Christian is a light and a blessing to other people. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. We understand here, though, that this has a reference to the miraculous age. To thus drink was to embrace his teaching and to obey his will, as verse 38 indicates. To believe on him was to acknowledge him as the Christ, the Messiah, and to espouse his cause. He who did was promised that from within him would flow rivers of living water, a sentiment expressed in such scriptures as Isaiah 58, 11, Zechariah 14, 8, Psalm 36, 8, and 9, according to Brother Guy in Woods. And he says that this means that those who drank of the living water, Christ would cause them to be fountains of blessings. Brother Franklin Camp says on this passage, the figure of living water flowing from the belly of believers was the preaching of the gospel by direct revelation and the confirmation of the gospel by these miraculous manifestations. The coming of the Spirit and the glorification of Christ is a reference to the miraculous operation of the Spirit beginning at Pentecost. The reception of the Spirit by believers of John 7, 38 and 39 is the miraculous endowments of believers that came through the hands of the apostles and is according to the promise of Joel 2 and the commission as recorded in Mark 16, 16 to 20. Now, as we think about the Christian, one who has come to Christ to drink, he does become a fountain of blessings to many people. But we know it is in the case of Mark 16, 16, verses 17 to 18, reply to the miraculous age, verse 38 and 39 of John 7 applies to the miraculous. Surely he that believeth and is baptized is for all time. That person shall be saved, Mark 16, 16. And also the invitation to come to Christ and to drink in John 7, 37 would be a permanent offer that Christ gives. But yet verses 38 and 39 apply to the miraculous age. I'd like to read from Mark 16 at this time, verse 17 and 18. This is after Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. In verses 17 and 18, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, that is demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so, friends, we may have a command that applies unto the end of the world, but also have something in the same context that applied only to the miraculous age, as in John 7, 37, and Mark 16, 16, but then the miraculous, verses 38 and 39 of John 7, and in Mark 16, verse 17 and 18. Now, as we think on these matters of fatal error taught on John chapter 7, those who declare that John 7, 38 and 39 holds promise for miraculous gifts beyond the apostolic age after the completion of the New Testament 
and for all believers to the end of time are involved in fatal error. And as other brethren have pointed out in this lectureship, fatal error is that which results with the condemnation of the soul. And so what we're saying today is those who teach the gifts beyond the first century, beyond the miraculous age, are teaching fatal error. They're teaching something that will cause people to lose their very souls. And I also want to add this, we're going to deal with this a little bit later. Those who teach that we need something in addition to the Word of God, even if they don't teach miracles for today, are also teaching fatal error, something that will result in the loss of souls and, of course, is destroying many congregations. And we need to be aware of this. Now, why is the doctrine of miraculous gifts for today fatal error? Why is this the case? Well, for one thing, it teaches that which the Scriptures deny, in that the completion of the New Testament would mark the cessation of gifts. Paul, in referring to the gifts in 1 Corinthians 13, said that when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away, namely the gifts, the miracles. In the context there, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 to 10. The same principle is taught in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 13. Those today who misapply verse 38 and other scriptures in order to teach that people receive directly from heaven the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, or in other words, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, are teaching that that exists today, that it did not end in the first century, that there's more than two occurrences of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Those two were in Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 10 at the house of Cornelius. In Acts 2 upon the apostles, in Acts chapter 10 at the house of Cornelius. Of course, they have to teach this because there are no apostles left today to lay hands to impart miraculous gifts, as we read in Acts chapter 8, verse 14 to 18. They teach the direct outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon man today. As we think about this today, there were never two events like this before, the beginning of the church, the coming of the kingdom, and the Holy Spirit bringing the gospel down from heaven in Acts 2, and the reception of the Gentiles into the kingdom in Acts chapter 10. And there will never be any like this again in any future time. In Ephesians chapter 4, some 20 years after the house of Cornelius, in Ephesians chapter 4, and we know that passage well, there is one body and one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Ephesians 4 verse 46. By the time that Paul wrote this, we note that there was only one baptism. And this has been well pointed out already today, and we appreciate that good material. But those who teach that we have miracles today are denying the truth of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. When they affirm that the Holy Ghost works miracles today through people, number one, they are teaching that which they cannot prove by visible signs. Number two, they are teaching that which contradicts apostolic teaching. Number three, they are teaching that which they have no scriptural basis to teach, and therefore that which they cannot teach in the name of the Lord Jesus, Colossians 3.17, that is, by the authority of Christ, who has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, verse number 18. We know that the signs or the gifts were given for the completion and the confirmation of the word of God and to guide the early church in her infancy, as we see in Samaria in Acts chapter 8, 14 to 18, and as we read regarding the confirmation in Mark, the end of the chapter, the end of the book, chapter 16, verse 19 and 20. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, that is, his apostles, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And that was in Acts chapter 1, you remember. 
Now we see what happened beginning in Acts chapter 2. Mark 16, 20 describes that. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following, Amen. Then in Hebrews, the second chapter, again we read of the confirmatory nature of the gifts. They are described as signs and wonders, diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. But now, friends, let's consider that various preachers have come to embrace the idea that the Spirit actually does something to man today, separate and apart from the Word of God. And I believe this was said yesterday, at least one time, maybe more, that what these men are teaching not only is fatal error, but they are opening the door to the idea that miraculous gifts are given for today, although they themselves would deny that. They are allowing the foundation for that teaching when they teach the things that they do. The efforts of one well-known writer, preacher, and debater, Brother Matt Deaver, has caused this fallacious doctrine to spread like a cancer, teaching that the Holy Spirit directly impacts or guides a man apart from the Word of God. It is not simply a matter of harmless opinion, but indeed is fatal error. We know that faithful brethren through the years have differed on the mode of the Spirit's indwelling. And only sound and faithful brethren who would hold to these two positions, or either one, are sound and faithful because they teach and advance the idea that the Spirit only guides and directs man through the Word of God. And faithful and sound brethren have differed on that matter, but they all have this in common, that it's only through the Word of God that we are led, and never separate and apart from the Word of God. Only by the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, verse 17. These all teach that we must abide in the doctrine of Christ to have the Father and the Son, 2 John 9. And that we need not and must not expect any impact or guidance separate and apart from the Word of God. But these brethren that we're describing here, such as Brother Deaver and others, are going far beyond that. They are not only teaching the personal indwelling of the Spirit, they are saying the Spirit impacts man and gives them some kind of direct help or guidance outside of the Holy Scriptures. Brother Deaver and those following his line of teaching assert that something in addition to the Word of God is needed in order to continue in a sanctified state and remain faithful to God. Although he and others of his ilk do not advance the idea of the miraculous for today, they declare that the word of God alone is insufficient for man's sanctification and purification. This is one reason, and there are others, that we say they are teaching fatal error. In his book, The Holy Spirit, Center of Controversy, Basis of Unity, he states the following. And when a Christian knowingly rejects a divine method of providential help delivery, saying to himself that he refuses to believe that God helps him personally and directly through the Spirit, but that all the divine help comes only and always through the Word itself, as Moffat contended, he forfeits the help that otherwise he could receive. So not only are they saying that you can receive that direct help, but you must know and believe that you receive it in order to receive it. I know it's confusing. And he goes on to say, remember Matthew 17. The principle of divine help delivery is a work in providence for the saint as it was in miracle endowment for the apostles and the other miracle working brethren. The requirement was faith in the promise. Now, 
to understand more clearly where he is coming from in this statement and that he connects this direct divine help through the Spirit with the person and dwelling of the Holy Spirit. Earlier in the chapter he says, now when we come to the issue of the work of the indwelling Spirit, we are not talking about terms of entry into the kingdom. However, we are talking about terms of endurance. That is, we are talking about how it is that a Christian can remain faithful. And if Christians can remain faithful only with the providential help of God, to disbelieve in that help or to reject the promise of that help by knowingly rejecting the means of delivery of that help is to forfeit the help that otherwise could be theirs. So not only does he teach that this direct help is needed from the Spirit, but that we must believe and know it in order to receive it. Well, friends, when it comes to the providence of God, there are many times, in fact, we cannot pinpoint when God's providence is acting, but we know that it's what God does for us. But Mac Deaver is teaching that providential help is what God does to you and not just for you. Isn't that the role of the Word of God? What does Hebrews 4.12 say? For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the binding of sunder of soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word of God reaches down into the innermost of man's being. It does impact man, but it's available to all. Jesus said this concerning his word. Who would dare say this is a dead letter? But yet there are those who do. And there are those who imply that it's not sufficient. Jesus said the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That, friends, is what we need to impact us, is the word of God. But also, Matt Deaver is teaching that we need direct providential help from the Holy Spirit in order to remain faithful to God. Now, where on earth in the Bible can that be found? Nowhere. It's not in there. Even by obedience to the Word of God and being strengthened by it, one still cannot endure until the end without this direct divine help delivery through the Spirit. He is plainly affirming. Actually, when they are doing this, Regarding the Spirit, they're inveighing against the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit who brought the gospel down from heaven, 1 Peter 1, 12, is in and through the Word of God. To say that that is not sufficient is to imply that the Holy Spirit's work is not what the Bible declares it is and was. Now, in the age of miracles, even though, the scriptures were needed in order to sanctify man and to keep him faithful. Even Timothy, who had a gift within him, according to 2 Timothy chapter 1, upon the imposition of Paul of the apostles' hands, he needed the scripture. What did Paul say to him in 2 Timothy 3, beginning at verse 14? But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that is complete, truly furnished, under every good work. And then another passage is found in the book of Acts chapter 20 when Paul met with the Ephesian elders at Miletus. And he gave them various warnings and charged them with the feeding of the flock, the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, Acts 20, verse 28. But in verse 32, how are you going to affect these things? How are you going to do them? This is the answer. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Now where in that passage do we read 
that the word alone is not enough to build you up and to lead you to that home of the sanctified, heaven itself. Did not Jesus Christ say in John 17, 17, when he prayed to the Father, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Now, friends, we note that sanctification and the spirit and the truth are all tied together. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13 and 14, Paul writing to the church of Thessalonica said, But we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel. Paul said concerning God, who would have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2, 4. Jesus said, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In 2 John 9, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Now, I want to go to a quotation from the biblical notes by one of the followers of MacDever, Michael Hildreth. We know that he makes this comment regarding the seven ones in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 to 6. And if you've heard brethren say before, believe it, who can? I want to read what he has to say here. He writes, Introduction. Ephesians chapter 4 is all about unity. There are seven ones mentioned by the Apostle Paul. I thought Brother Bruce had a good point this morning when he said we can all count to one. You know, even children can do that. It reminds me of a little boy coming from church service one Sunday morning. A skeptic stopped him and he said, Sonny, I'll give you a dime if you can tell me where God, where God is. He said, Mister, I'll give you a dollar if you can tell me where God ain't. You know, children... They can figure these things out. One means one. But one has a new definition according to Michael Hildreth. I'm sure that uh, Rubel Shelley and the denominations would appreciate the help that he is giving them here on this passage, which we've often, with faithful brethren, have stood firm on through the years. But he says, further, these ones bind us together in faith. We share a relationship with one another and with the Lord because we adhere to these ones. However, remember, one doesn't mean one. We see a plurality in each of them. One body, many local congregations, parenthetically bodies, many members, many ethnicities, one Lord, Jesus is the one Lord, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet, the Father is also the one Lord, Mark 12, 29. And the Holy Spirit is the one Lord, 2 Corinthians 3, 17. There are not three, but only one. One God, the Father, but Jesus is also everlasting Father, and our Lord and God, Isaiah 9, 6, John 20, 28. The Holy Spirit is also God, Acts 5, 3, and 4. Well, that's true, but in this context, Paul is referring to Jesus Christ as the one Lord and the Holy Spirit as one Spirit and to God the Father as the one God and Father over all. But let's read further. There are not three gods, but one God with three manifestations slash expressions. One faith, multiple beliefs, faiths, we hold within our common faith. For example, the resurrection, the inspiration of the Bible, the deity of Jesus, the authority of the apostles, etc. None of these are absolute ones. Did you know that? The seven ones of Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 are not absolute ones. Because they have multiple components for citizens in the kingdom. This is a similar consideration when it comes to the one baptism of Ephesians 4 or 5. That's what this is all about right here. So he can teach Holy Spirit baptism for today. 
That's why he's doing all this, tearing Ephesians chapter 4 apart, so he can teach Holy Spirit baptism for today. He says, Jesus identifies two components of baptism, John 3, 5. The ones point to the unity of several elements, not exclusive items. This, my friends, is an example of the absurd position that these men have taken in the lengths to which they will go in an attempt to prove their false doctrine. In addition to the fact that he takes the entire passage out of context, Hildreth even goes so far as to say that the one faith includes multiple beliefs or faiths. No, don't, wouldn't the denominations love that? They've taught that for years. But now they have a colleague and a comrade with them in Michael Hildreth. He certainly has a gross misunderstanding concerning the expression, the faith, which the saints of God are content earnestly for. Jude said, contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. But according to Hildreth, contend earnestly for the faiths that were once delivered to the saints. Which will we take, Jude or Hildreth and Deaver? Any doctrine, my friends, which implies a false doctrine is within itself a false doctrine. Indeed, those who teach this error are teaching something that is not according to the doctrine of Christ. They must be marked and withdrawn from. We are to mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them, Paul said in Romans 16 and 17. And if any bring another doctrine, we are not to bid them God's speed. If they're coming in to you and bring not this doctrine, that is the doctrine of Christ, do not welcome him into your house, John said. You are not to bid him God's speed in any way. And yet there are many brethren who are doing this very thing. Now I was talking to a brother here recently, and uh, I was discussing a situation in one city where there are two congregations that are not in fellowship. One is faithful and sound, and the other one is not. But he desired to have fellowship with the unfaithful congregation. And he said the un, of the unfaithful congregation, well, they teach withdrawing fellowship just like this other one does. I said, yes, but the difference is this. The faithful congregation practices it. That's the difference. And you can read writings by men like Robert Taylor in the Memphis School of Preaching that teach truth on these subjects. But when it comes to practicing it, that is where they miss the mark. Amen. They are not practicing it. And again, the Apostle John said, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any into you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. As we close, Paul said, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Thank you.